But I think something that I really want to to point to is the ways in which, you know, you talk about the ways in which language, uh, dehumanizing language, uh, sets the stage for for the sort of dehumanization that we're seeing right now. Um, there's us versus them kind of thing that we're seeing. Uh, and I, and I want to point to the ways in which not just Trump, who's so obvious about his, his disdain for minorities, immigrants, you know, people that he views as the other. Um, but I want to, I want to talk about, say the ways that previous presidencies, previous leaders, that we've had, you know, like Obama or or Clinton or Bush or 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 any of these or previous uh, presidencies that we've had that have definitely furthered the neoliberal economic and social agendas, but they were such they they were very polite politicians, I guess you could say, compared to what we have with Trump. Um, if I could ask about the ways in which a sort of a, a neoliberal language has been used to set the stage for this rising fascism and authoritarianism in the United States. And maybe maybe using examples from presidents that we don't normally associate with that, like Obama, for instance. Uh, what is some of the language that's used to do that? I mean, I mean, look, you know, Reagan began his presidency attacking welfare queens. Mm. I mean, Reagan began his, as, as a governor, basically traded in, in red baiting particularly around somebody like Angela Davis. Um, I mean, when you look at Bush, the first Bush, I mean, you know, he, 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 he gave us the Willie Horton ads. Uh, you know, when, 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 you, when, you, when you look at the way in which Cheney and that, that Bush regime emerged with its endless lies, its implicit coded sex, sexism and racism, uh, you, you have to understand something, and that is that fascism starts with language. And it starts with the language of brutality, which essentially, if used long enough, becomes normalized. I mean, there's a long tradition in the United States in which this neoliberal narrative of separating people along lines of friends and enemy has always been racially and class and gender coded. Uh, it, it was just, you know, it was just hidden a bit, it, it, it seems to me, uh, it, with, with some of these people. I mean, it wasn't as overt. As, as it was, as it is, of course, with, with Trump. I mean, Trump brings the surface elements of this language of fascism to the center of politics. That's what he does. I mean, the, the origins of the t- fascism in terms of its ultranationalism, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a template, the, the discourse of decline, uh, its contempt, not just for liberalism, but for intellectual thought, the claim that America is always in crisis, the contempt for weakness, I mean, what this language, since the ni- particularly since the 1980s, has produced is not only a racist ecosystem, a class-based hatred of justice and equality, but it, it also has produced a language of disposability and a culture of cruelty that is unlike anything we have seen. I mean, look, let's go back to somebody like, like Clinton. I mean, people talk about Clinton as the great savior because there was a, a somewhat of an economic boom during his regime. Clinton, to me, uh, in, in many ways, was, was horrible in, in terms of what he did around uh, expanding uh, the, the, the punishment state, uh, in imposing uh, you know, uh, uh, laws around three strikes and you're out. Law and or, a law and order agenda that put millions, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people of color in prison. His, his, what he did to dismantle basically the economy by going after the Glass-Steagall Act. What he did by attacking welfare roles. I mean, these, these are all instances of a language that basically sees the other as excess that sees the other as disposable, that sees the other as non-human in some way. This is the language, this is the language, Patrick, of objectification. It's a language of, it's a language of reification. And when you dehumanize people and you reify them long enough, that language operates in the service of violence. I mean, think about Trump's language, which is right, I mean, this is the language of war, this is the language of hatred, it's the language of ethnic cleansing, it's the language of racial purity, it's the language of white supremacy. I mean, it's a language in which certain groups are seen 
as not only expendable, but actually when he says, we sh as he recently allegedly claimed that border guards should shoot immigrants in the legs, <laughs> I mean, who accuses people in Congress or anybody who disagrees with them of treason. I mean, this is the language of war. This is the language of war. This is a contempt for people who disagree. It elevates, elevates instinct over emotion. It's anti-intellectual. It has a contempt. It exhibits a contempt for the rule of law. Uh, and it, it, it harbors an enormous fear of what we call the other. It's, it's an elimination language. And what scares me is that the misery imposed by neoliberalism with its massive engine of social death, its massive engine of, of basically human suffering and misery, its endless production of in massive inequalities in wealth and power has now paved the way for a kind of neo-fascist discourse that merges with racial purity, white supremacy, and ethnic cleansing. Okay. Well, I want to I want to kind of talk a little more about language because uh, there was a part in your the article that I mentioned uh, that you had published in Truth Out, um, in which we talk about how right wing populists create diversions and distract away from uh, neoliberal inequities. Uh, I'll just quote something really quick here, just to set the stage here. Uh, you say. In a masterful act of political diversion, populist leaders attacked all vestiges uh, of, of liberal capitalism while refusing to name neoliberal inequities in wealth and power as a basic threat to their societies. Instead of calling for an acceleration of the democratic ideals of popular sovereignty and equality, right-wing populist leaders such as Trump, Bolsonaro, and Hungary's uh, Viktor Orban uh, defined democracy as the enemy of those who wish for unaccountable power. They also diverted genuine popular anger into the uh, into the abyss of cultural chauvinism, anti-immigrant hatred, and a contempt of Muslims and a targeted attack on the environment, healthcare, education, public institutions, social provisions, and other basic life resources. Um, so I think this is interesting because it's, it's like something that I kind of sensed as Trump was, was gearing up for the election was a sense that he was talking about, you know, globalization in a sense, or, or globalism, I guess, is kind of the word I hear often on the right when we talk about um, a global economic system. Um, so he was speaking to, for instance, uh, so-called free trade agreements as, as undermining, um, uh, you know, U.S. sovereignty and, and uh, empowerment of workers in the United States, you know, which is something that's actually true, right? But of course, then it's a diversion after that. It's not actually addressing the underlying structure of neoliberalism. You're not going to hear Trump present a well-articulated, uh, well-researched <laughs> critique of neoliberalism at all. No, he's going to blame immigrants. He's going to blame the other. He's going to use language of dehumanization in order to further his campaign and, and sort of build his base. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which right-wing populists use they, they touch on it just enough to get people to understand, like, okay, he's on my side. He's going to use his power for me and for my own. But, no, then, I, but then divert that towards a sort of anger, a resentment, a, a fracturing of the culture in general. No, Patrick, you've said it more eloquently than I have. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I think you're absolutely right. I, I mean, what they have done is they've tapped into real problems in some cases that people are facing. Uh, but they've only tapped into those problems in order to mobilize the fear and the outrage in ways that benefit their own economic and political interest. That's the difference. I mean, they don't tap into outrage in, in ways to reveal very basic underlying economic and political factors that have produced the suffering that people have, have now find themselves in, whether we're talking about the desolated landscapes uh, all over the United States that have been produced as a result of globalization, or they don't talk about the housing crisis and how poor people had to pay, and how the, the Obamas of the world sort of bailed out the, the bankers and, and the Goldman, people from Goldman Sachs. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't really talk about how capitalism, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, has nothing to do with the needs of the people that they're concerned about. I mean, I think that when you live in a culture marked by the kind of anti-intellectualism that we find in the United States, uh, it becomes very easy 
to sort of mobilize people in ways in which you actually point to a real problem, but then you divert the issue in ways to suggest, don't worry, I can solve, I, I alone can solve this problem, when in fact, the people who are arguing that are basically people who, who believe in a value system that has produced the problem. I mean, mm-hmm. Trump claims he's for the working people, he's going to produce infrastructure, he's going to, uh, in, in a sense, do something about health care, uh, and so forth and so on. When in fact, what he's done is pass regressive tax measures that benefit the rich. He's deregulated uh, all kinds of safety and business and ecological policies that are going to hurt poor people because their children are going to suffer under a debased ecosystem that's collapsing. Uh, he has no interest whatsoever in addressing the health care system except to make it more difficult for people to actually get health insurance. And so it, it, it seems to me you have, you, you have a switch and bait discourse here. At one level, we point to some of capitalism's problems, global, particularly glo- global capitalism. At another level, we mobilize those fears, the fears, genuine fears in some cases, on the part of people who are suffering from these problems in ways that completely divert the issue by blaming uh, Mexicans, by blaming immigrants, by blaming Muslims. Uh, and so in a sense, what you have here is you have the merging of neo, the problems caused by neo, global neoliberalism with, in fact, the appropriation of a fascist politics that trades in white supremacy, ethnic cleansing, and, the, and white nationalism. So this is a very interesting kind of move because it represents the merging, uh, in, in many ways, of neoliberalism, fascism, neoliberal fascism, as both a project and a movement. As a project, of course, neoliberalism destroys all the commanding institutions of democracy while consolidating power in the hands of relatively few a financial elite. And as a movement, it endlessly legitimates and further reproduces economic quality, massive suffering, the privatization of public goods, the dismantling of essential government agencies, and it individualizes social problems. And that's exactly what Trump did.